Welcome all you ampliologists out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video. Hopefully the preceding two videos established a foundation of knowledge regarding resistors and Ohm's law. Now I'd like to take that basic understanding and move ahead to something more specific and a little more complex. And that is, what is the function of the four resistors that we see on virtually every vacuum tube in an amplifier circuit. First off, there is almost always a fairly high value resistor between the input or the preceding stage and the grid of the next tube. Secondly, there is always a high value resistor between the grid of the tube and ground. Third, there is always a medium to low value resistor between the cathode of the tube and ground. And fourth, there is always a resistor, usually around 100K, connected to the plate of the tube. As we will see, these four resistors, one, two, three, four, all have specific names and very specific purposes. Also, I should state that during this video, I will from time to time take a break to tell you some interesting and amusing facts about my assistant, Jack the Cat, and hopefully demonstrate his uncanny retrieval skills. Since Jack is such a pampered and talented kitty, you can't expect him to drink out of an old ceramic bowl, so we have this crystal goblet here by the fireplace for him to drink out of. Jack, are you going to take a drink out of your crystal goblet? We know you don't like the old ceramic bowl like a regular cat. So come on, take a drink. Show the people how pampered you are. Quit admiring yourself in the fireplace glass. To simplify things, I've drawn a diagram here showing the four resistors that we will cover. First will be the grid leak resistor. Uh, which is rather high value, uh, between 500K and 3 meg ohms, and it is located between the grid and ground. Second will be the grid stopper resistor, uh, ranging from 1.5K in output tubes all the way up to 470K on preamp tubes, and it is located between the input or the preceding stage and the grid of the following tube. The third one we will cover is the cathode bias resistor, uh, which connects the cathode to ground and ranges from a low of around 250 ohms all the way up to 10,000 ohms in some preamp tubes. The fourth resistor is the one that's probably the least understood, and that is the plate resistor, which is almost always 100,000 ohms and connects the plate to the rest of the circuit. To ensure that the videos are of manageable length, I'm going to break this down into two parts. Uh, first part, we'll discuss the grid stopper and the grid leak, and how they can apply very practically to one of the best known input circuits in guitar amps, the one used by Fender. Okay, let's start off now with the grid stopper resistor. It's the one between the input or preceding stage and the grid of the following tube. Before we get started, let's discuss something that I think is a very important topic, and that is the capacitance of vacuum tubes. Remember what a capacitor looks like. You have two plates that are separated by either insulating material or space, and they are oppositely charged. That's exactly what we have here with a vacuum tube. We have a negatively charged cathode, and a positively charged plate separated by insulating space. Uh, as a result, vacuum tubes have a capacitance of around 100 picofarads. So in a circuit, you might even consider, instead of seeing a vacuum tube right here, you might consider seeing a capacitor instead, a 100 picofarad cap. And that is essential to the function of the grid stopper resistor because the resistor works with the tube capacitance, which is about 100 picofarads, to form 
a low pass filter, which means it excludes very high frequencies. Here's the diagram. Those of you who watch the uh, tone stack videos uh, are familiar with what a low pass filter looks like. You have a resistor and then a capacitor. The relatively low frequencies pass through unscathed and the very high frequencies in this case because of the value of the, cap of the capacitance of the tube and the uh, grid stopper resistor, uh, we will send very high frequencies uh, to ground or out of the circuit. Now since this low pass filter that is created by the grid stopper and tube capacitance only attenuates or eliminates very high frequencies, generally above 20,000 cycles per second, it doesn't affect the audio frequency gain. So we're only going to eliminate the very high frequency uh, tones and uh, signals that we can't hear anyway. So you're saying to yourself, well, if I can't hear them, what do I care? Well, you do, because radio frequencies are much higher than audio, but they can enter the input stage of your amplifier, become rectified within the input stage, and amplified and create radio frequency noise. The grid stopper resistor will effectively prevent this. Number two, uh, and this is something that's very serious and most people I don't think know about. It can prevent high frequency parasitic oscillation. Now, generally, this is beyond your hearing. Uh, and if this starts up in your amp, there can become an oscillation within your amp that you can't hear. That's like a dog chasing its tail faster and faster until the amp uh, or the tubes within the amp can self-destruct. So this is a very serious problem. The uh, manifestations of this that you might be able to detect would be a squeal, red plating of your output tubes, harsh treble, uh, and maybe some other less apparent uh, symptoms. So by having the grid stopper resistor with this forming the low pass filter with the tube capacitance, we can eliminate this rather invisible problem that can destroy your output tubes and the function of your amp. And the third and probably most apparent of the functions of the grid stopper resistor is to limit the current that can be applied to the grid of the tube, particularly the first uh, preamp tube. What if the strength or current of the input signal were so great that it severely overdrove the tube, giving you all sorts of just atrocious distortion, and if the grid becomes positive, actually blocking distortion, where the signal will be so great that it will actually stop the tube from functioning. Okay, to prevent this then, we'll use the grid stopper resistor. And because I like to be specific rather than just nebulous, let's talk about a specific example uh, of the tube that we see in the preamp position more often than any other tube. And that is a 12AX7. The 12AX7 has a capacitance of around 151 picofarads. So if we use a 68K grid stopper resistor, we will not attenuate high frequencies until they reach around 15.5 thousand cycles per second. Now granted, this is below 20,000, but to most people and uh, for most guitar amplifiers, the signals above 15.5 thousand are really not that audible or that noticeable. So elimination of them is no great loss. If we lower the resistance somewhat, say from 68K down to 34K, you will not begin to attenuate until 31,000 cycles per second. So as you can see, the lower the resistance, the higher the frequency cutoff. Keep this and these values in mind for when we discuss the Fender input circuit. Here's Jack's toy box as a pampered kitty. He has to have lots of toys. 
to keep himself occupied, uh, things that he's found and dragged in. Uh, also, his favorite are his paper retrieval toys like this. So let's demonstrate what a fabulous retriever he is. Well, here's Jack taking a little nap on his towels on the couch. Here's your toy box, Jack. Why don't you pick out a toy that you'd really like to retrieve for us? Okay, pick one out. See anything there that looks good? No, guess not. I'll pick one for you then. Okay, I'll pick one out. Let's see. That one looks like a dandy. Now in the past you've really let me down on these retrieval demonstrations, but I can see in your eye, that glint in your eye, that today will be different. Are you ready? Now let's move on to the grid leak resistor, which as we saw in the diagram is between the grid and ground. Very high resistance, generally 500K to 3 million ohms. The grid leak resistor has three main purposes. Number one, provides the grid with a reference to ground. Now this isn't going to make a lot of sense to a lot of people right now, but when we get to our discussion in the next video of the cathode bias resistor, I will hopefully make this clear. But for now, uh, the grid leak resistor uh, will m help the grid maintain a stable charge of around zero and work with the slightly positive cathode to bias the tube. Now the bias of the tube, which is the amount of current that's going to flow through it when there is no signal applied, uh, has to be very carefully maintained. If it's too low, the tube won't function. If it's too high, the tube will run away and burn itself up. So we have to, uh, just like with the faucet and the bathtub, control the flow of current through the tube uh, and maintain a reasonable flow. Okay, we don't want excessive flow, we don't want uh, inadequate flow, it has to be about right for our tube and our amp to function properly. And it is the relationship of the charge of the grid and the charge of the cathode uh, in cathode biased tubes that help the tube maintain that reasonable flow of current. As I said, we will discuss this in greater detail in the next video. Now, think about this. The electrons are coming off of the cathode and flying at great velocity up here toward the plate of the tube. The grid, we know, will modulate that flow by the charge, the signal charge that's on it. When the signal charge uh, is positive, it will let more electrons go through. When the signal charge is negative, it will impede the passage and discourage the electrons that are trying to flow to the uh, plate. But how about the electrons that don't pass through the grid, but actually strike the grid? Uh, wouldn't, and I'll think about this, if those electrons stick to the grid, and remember electrons confer a negative uh, charge, an accumulation of electrons along the grid is going to affect its charge and then affect its relationship with the cathode and then greatly affect the flow of current through the tube. So we cannot allow an accumulation of electrons to form here on the grid of the tube. Well, what better way to eliminate that problem than to allow the electrons to have a safe passage to ground through the grid stopper, which is of such a low value, it really is not involved in this process as much as the grid leak resistor down here, which is a much higher value. But as you can see, there is a pathway to ground for those electrons, so they will not accumulate on the grid. Now the third function of the grid leak resistor is, I think, the most evident and that is that it establishes the signal path impedance to ground. People throw the term impedance around a lot. Uh, I don't know that they fully understand what it means. I know a lot of people do, but for those who don't, what do you think it means? I have a feeling 
that a lot of people think it's the grid stopper resistor. They see a 68K resistor right here and they think, oh, that's the impedance of my signal uh, to the grid. Well, that's really not the impedance that is important. What is important is the impedance provided by the grid leak resistor to ground. So we've already seen that the grid leak resistor is essential for the tube to function to maintain the bias in a cathode biased tube, to provide a pathway to ground for electrons to prevent the amp from either running away or stop uh, ceasing to function. So we have to have a resistor to ground and the value of that resistor will allow our signal or some of it to leak to ground. The amount of signal that it allows to leak to ground is the impedance of the input circuit. Okay, if you only allow a tiny bit with say a one meg or three meg uh, grid leak resistor, you have a high impedance input. In other words, what, 98% of the signal is going to go to the grid, 2% is going to go to ground. Say you put in a 250K uh, grid leak resistor. In that case, much more of your signal is going to go to ground and your input signal will be reduced significantly before it reaches the grid. This would be a low impedance input circuit. So next time you look at a schematic of your amplifier circuit, don't fret about the grid stopper as far as impedance goes. Fret about the grid leak resistor. Okay, Jackie. Now we're going to show them your fabulous retrieval skills. Ready? Here's your toy. There it goes. Look at that. Wow. Okay, bring it back to Papa. Come on. Jack, don't roll around on the floor. Bring it back. Now, since I'm really not into philosophy, let's take a look at a practical application of what we have just learned. And uh, I think probably the most popular and familiar of all the input circuits in amplifiers would be the traditional Fender input circuit. It's deceptively simple looking. It is not simple. It is actually rather complex and it does things that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. It generally involves two self-grounding input jacks that are wired in this rather unusual fashion. 68K, 68K, one meg, and then an input to the grid. Once again, to keep things simple, I have isolated this circuit and drawn an enlarged diagram of it so that we can analyze it. Uh, as you can see, it's identical to the one uh, in the schematic. There are generally two inputs, input number one and input number two. And those of you who have ever plugged in to input 1 and input 2 know there's a significant difference in uh, the uh, amount of uh, volume and slightly in the tone that you get from the amp when you plug into these two different inputs. If you've ever wondered why, I think if you watch for the next couple of minutes, you will understand. Okay, let's plug in to input number 1 and here comes our signal. Input number two remains grounded, okay? It's the input leaf is touching the ground leaf and number two then is grounded, which is nice because that means it can't pick up any noise. But it also serves another hidden purpose. Okay, now that we've plugged into input number one, let's see what the grid stopper resistance is. In other words, the resistance between the input and the grid of the tube. Here comes our signal, and it has two pathways. It can go this way to the grid, or it can come around through the self-grounded number two input jack and come down this way. In other words, there are two 68K resistors in parallel between the signal and the grid. Two 68Ks in parallel will give you 34K ohms of resistance. So the grid stopper resistance is actually a value that's not even present or evident in the schematic. 
It's the 268s in parallel, so you have 34K ohms of grid stopper resistance. Now let's look at the grid leak resistance, which we know establishes the impedance of the input. Here comes our signal, and here's a lovely pathway straight to ground through a 1 meg ohm resistor. So, input to ground, 1 million ohms. We can say then that this input right here has the minimal uh, grid stopper resistance and the maximum grid leak resistance. It is a very high impedance input and it will give you maximum gain, at least when compared to input number two. Now let's plug in to input jack number two and see what the resistance is between that input and the grid of the tube. In other words, the grid stopper resistance. And as we can see, our signal doesn't have two pathways because the uh, input leaf is lifted off of ground, so it comes in here. It has no other way to go but through a 68K ohm resistor and to the grid. So the input to grid or grid stopper resistance will be 68K ohms. Let's look at the input to ground or the grid leak resistance. In this case, the signal comes along here. Remember, it has no pathway down here to ground. It has to come this way through 68K. 68K, again, in series, can bypass the 1 meg ohm resistor and come straight down here to ground. So the input to ground resistance is two 68K ohm resistors in series for a total of 136K ohms. Now let's compare the results when we plug into jack number one compared to jack number two. Number one, we said, was the high impedance input jack, which would give us high gain. Why? Because the uh, impedance or input uh, resistance to ground is 1 million ohms. When we plug into jack number two, it's only 136,000 ohms, which is what? About one-eighth as much. So considerably more of our signal will go to ground when we plug into jack number two than it will when we jack, uh, plug into jack number one. Now the second difference is a little more subtle. Remember we saw that when our grid stopper resistance uh, was at 68K, uh, we will start to attenuate at 15.5 kilohertz. However, at 34K, we won't attenuate into 31 kilohertz. That means then that with our low impedance input, which has the 68K grid stopper or input to grid resistance, uh, we're going to attenuate above 15.5 thousand cycles per second. When we plug into jack number one, we're at 34K uh, resistance between input and grid because of the 268s in parallel, and therefore we will not attenuate until over 30,000 cycles per second. So here we're going to lose a bunch of our signal to ground and we're going to lose some of our high frequency. Okay, let's try again. Here's your toy. Get it, Jack. Go get it. There it is. Jack, it's back there. Well, I guess that's about it for this video. Uh, Jack here is just tuckered out from all his retrieving and cooperating. Uh, and is taking a little nap on the couch, and I think I'll do the same. So thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for our part two video covering the cathode uh, bias resistor and the plate resistor. See you then. Bye for now.